Welcome to the Trend Detection Podcast, powered by Siemens. And now your host, Niall Sullivan. I guess what I'm wondering now is whether um, things like AI and machine learning are a cu- customer sort of demanding or demanding or asking or really intrigued about these technologies yeah. or do they on the other side find it quite overwhelming because there's a lot of talk about it of what it can do what it can't do what it might do yeah and it's like all this information is like oh how do i apply this to my business like you said to what we've been saying the business problem it's not just the technology but and how does it fit in culturally with what we're you know what we're trying to achieve as well yeah i mean i said about that large language models i mean we were inundated with questions about large language models. Is is it going to? Can I just now have all my software built using a large language model? I just tell it in English what to do, and lo and behold, software comes out the other side. Well, um, you know, we we had to armor our teams with an answer to that question because it's a, it's a good question, right? right? I mean, if you if you look at the hype around it, um, it certainly will do that. You can certainly you know ask it to build software, and it, it will it will build it for you. The problem with that is that it's software that's it's the actual low level coding of software that's the problem. It's hard to maintain. It's difficult to understand. It's even difficult to understand when you know somebody's written it who works for you. But when it's been completely automatically generated by a third party AI engine, it's even further away from your ability to control it. You know the risks involved in that, the maintenance involved in that. Um, I'd argue that's very difficult. I think it would be very difficult to convince, you know, um, a C-level executive to. Um, to both automate that and then bring it inside and, and risk manage, manage it mm-hmm. and maintain it and support it. You know, we'd advocate that actually moving away from writing code is the thing you need to do. You need to combine your skills into new technologies that help you to address and, and harness AI. So we, we're talking about how do you do that? How do you bring that into your existing systems? How do you make it work for you? What's the value we want out of it? Rather than just suggesting that perhaps it will just take away all of the hard work of building software. Because um, you know, I, I don't believe that. Personally, believe that it that it will not anytime soon. Anyway, Hi. and I guess a lot of it comes down to trust. And you could move beyond that to AI, and machine learning, into technology. Is putting trust in the technology is a key. Mm-hmm. And again, referring back to predictive maintenance, sometimes that's in backfields. Like you know, yeah. is it too good to be true? Kind yeah. of thing. is that that yeah. kind of mindset as well? Is that something that ex- you experience? As well? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, um, like I said, when you, know, when you when you demo Mendix, and there's nobody. I think I've, I've demoed. Mendix over the last 13 years many many times and nobody everybody loves Mendix as a, as a product mm. and I think technologies like this people love them because you know on the face of it they solve lots and lots of complex problems um, the reality of life is most technology that makes it to market um, you know um, probably addresses a specific set of problems very well um, the question is can you make it work for you you know can you can you harness that technology to your advantage and there's great examples of great technology that doesn't have the impact um, on the business. And that generally is because it was probably purchased for the wrong reasons, the structures around it weren't mature enough, it wasn't adopted, um, you, you know, there was no plan for it in terms of how you use that technology to advance your agenda. And it needs a level of support and engagement um, for technology to take, take a foothold. We see that in our role in companies that, that do well with Mendix. They use our methodology to to encourage the business to go through this um, this process of building something that's that that can be demonst- demonstrably show value, and then we give them a path to how you then start to do more of that, but in a structured and controlled way, so that over time you move from sort of probably building relatively small application that's high impact to you know understanding you know how your organization structures behind building more of those applications how do you train the people what kind of people need to be involved what processes need to be involved how the platform works then eventually you move from building you know one or two apps to building hundreds of apps Um, but that doesn't happen overnight so those organizations that are not prepared to sort of invest in um, making the most out of the technology will struggle and I think that's comes back to what we talked about earlier most of these things come down to whether or not you know you can make it work for you as an organization and i guess a key part of that is how measure like measuring yeah. the success of it as well is there any sort of guidance you could give yeah i mean we, we we typically um we, we we go back to the portfolio again i think what's important mm. in our world and and you know perhaps I'd, I'd argue in the world of building software to address digitization which is 
probably a lot of what you're doing is building or using new software, you need to understand what problems are you solving, what's the value of that problem to the business, and what's the investment required to get you that, that outcome, um, and to focus on those things that are actually going to be transformative. You know, um, understanding the value helps you make a better case for investment, it uh, helps you understand what the um, what the perceived value was at the outset and whether you realise that value once you um, delivered on the solution. It gives you a value-based mentality. It surprises me, often surprises me, um, how little some organisations think about the value of, of the app uh, or the solution they're trying to solve. Um, and I think if you can come at it from that focus, it makes life a lot easier down the line when you're trying to gather momentum because you say, look, we set off with this particular problem and we said we'd do it in you know, a, a time frame that was less than we'd done it before, um, which meant we would have saved X amount. We you know, got it to market quicker, so opportunity costs mm. we brought forward and then the application was accepted well, it, was, it worked functionally, it was working well and so on. So you end up with, a, you know, if, you, if you can set off with those objectives, it's very measurable. You know, in in the technology we used before, it took us six months. And now it took us two months. You know, that's four months of extra time of the product in the market. Those kinds of things. So, creating that understanding value and then assessing the the points at which you deliver on it and seeing whether you have delivered is important. Yeah, and I guess it's also because again we said at the beginning, digital transformation as a whole is an ongoing thing. There's no, it's not a project, as you said. It's not, yeah, it's which usually you do have measurables with projects, but yeah. it's almost you've got to have sort of checkpoints along yeah. the way. Yeah. Is a, probably a better way to describe. Yeah, I think it, you're right? right. Absolutely, it's got to be. In, let's check in. I mean, it's it's, it's you know using agile methodologies, right? You, mm. It's the same kind of thing. At some point, you've got to come together and do a retrospective and look back at what went well, what what didn't go so well. Um, getting software out to business quickly, testing and learning, better quality, all those kinds of things. So it's this, it's that holistic view and making sure that you're doing all of those things that ultimately will deliver the value. But back to what we said at the beginning, you know, it's hard. You know, I'm not sitting here just saying that this is easy because it didn't. It, it does require you to mobilize large parts of the organization behind it. But the rewards are, and those companies that do it well, the rewards are incredible, um, you know, transformative. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I guess, yeah, it's been a fantastic conversation. I think it'd be a really good time to sort of summarise some of our, just some of the themes we've discussed, I guess. I guess key takeaways for people if they're thinking of embarking on this journey, if you want to call it, they might be in the middle of it, they might be at the end, yeah. you know, towards the end of it. But I guess what would you, your advice be, the, the key sort of pillars to sort of focus their attention on for successful? Yeah, I, I, I think... Um, You've got to get buy-in, right? I think it's it's like anything in, in in life. It's very difficult to push something like a digital transformation agenda without getting buy-in. So first of all, I think it's clearly understanding what is it you want to try and achieve. You've got to create some common language for for talking about it, so that everybody knows what you mean when you say we're transforming our business. Um, I think I think we have to I think we have to be clear about whether transforming or optimizing. You know, are we are we using technology to just get better at what we do, or are we actually taking on our company on a journey where we're going to explore new ways of doing things? So, being clear with yourselves and the organisation about what it is you want to do, and you know, both things of you know can have significant impact on business. So, I think clearly understanding that, understanding it from the value perspective, so ensuring that you know just exactly what you expect out of it from a business value point of view. Um, and then it's about winning hearts and minds for me. It's about how do you get that into the organisation in a way that you know you can bring people with you, um, that you can educate them. And I think if you did one thing, just bringing multiple disciplinary teams together, um, educating, continuously playing back the same narrative, um, ensuring that you're consistent with language, um, and it's based in some form of um, identifiable business value, the technology aspects and uh, actual making it happen um, will probably will will certainly be a lot easier for you as a business. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd sort of start there. You've got to script the path, right? You like anything that's complex, you have to you know what am I going to do on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on <laughs> Thursday, right? You you've got to go down to that level to make sure that you know you you um, you embark on a journey systematically. Yeah, and bring people with you. And that it's clear and focused. Clear, focused, um, communicable. Because 
somebody's going to have to tell the story when you're, if, if you're the CEO or the CTO, other people are going to have to tell the story when you're not in the room. You, 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 you mm. can't be everywhere. So unless you can create that language and instill that into the organizational structure, it just gets diffused as it gets further down the organization and becomes less impactful and very difficult to, to, to manage. And again, that's what we were saying about it not just being something from the, it has to come from the top, but yeah. it does have to work yeah. its way yeah. down, it become it, the lifeblood of the organisation, you could say. It, as a, it as does. An I mean, I mean w- w- one area I would say, though, is that it, it, it is quite easy to get started. You know, I wouldn't, mm. you know, I, I, I don't want to convey that, you know, you, you've got to spend years doing that, right? I mm. think what you've got to, to, to do is, is to identify something that you can hang your hat on. What we typically do when we work with organizations, back to the portfolio exercise, well look, look, what are the things that we could do that be that would move the needle for you as a business that have been difficult to do in the past? They're not overly complex, but it's just too difficult to get going. So for example, we want to integrate 15 systems all over the world and build something on top. They're not the most, they're not the best use cases because they're just so mired in the technical challenges that it, they're often very difficult to do. So we mm. try to identify something from the outset that has, could have high visibility, could have a high impact, probably is relatively complex in terms of integration capabilities and we identify that project and then we use that project as the sort of poster child for transformation. So we say okay, digital transformation for us in our world means we need to do more of this. Here's a great example of something we did, we did it in 30 days with four people, um, it cost us X, uh, and now that system, which we probably would have never have got off the backlog before, is out in the wild, customers are using it, prospects are using it, employees are using it, um, and then you take that on a roadshow, you take that round the organization and you start to gather the momentum. Um, it's interesting because I've been in the software development industry for many years, and typically when you say, well, you know, I want you to be of a software de- part of a software development project, people go, they generally go wrong. I don't want to be part of that, right? But with, when you start to invest in um, the sort of process that you've talked about, what happens is that they become a bit of a magnet. People want to be part of it because for the first time you're showing success in a short period of time, you're showing value, and then it's almost a self, it's might be like a snowball, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you do it properly, it gains momentum as you go and you can push that journey through the organization easier. And is it driven by maybe, because uh, uh, again, referring back to Sensei, we talk about PDN champions so ch- within, mm. within customers who, mm. who drive the, let's say, the rollout further and further. And you're yeah. talking about within an organization, but we're talking about plants and things yeah. like that, Sensei. But is it is that quite important, having champ- champions? Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. absolutely. You know, we, we identify champions all the way through, um, you know, when engaging with customers who either have bought Mendix or haven't um, because without them very little happens mm. I mean you'll, you'll get individual pockets of success but they'll be relatively fragmented they'll be disconnected from the transformational agenda and whilst they're incredibly valuable it's the sum of those things when you bring them together that helps you move the business forward so creating champions is important actually identifying people who um, perhaps have never been involved in something like that. I mean, we what I find incredible about Mendix is we take people who've never built software before and they solve complex problems with Mendix. And once the first time they do that and they see something go live, that they were involved material in either building or participating in requirements gathering and testing and automation, so a light bulb goes on that all of a sudden I can, rather than suffering under the weight of the problems, I can actually be part of solving the problem. And then champions emerge. They, they, they come out as part of the process. The question is, how do you give them a sounding board? How do you get them in front of the right people? Mm, and yeah. the more you can push those champions and give them a platform, you know, at the executive level, the better it is. So, you know, execs need to sort of think about that. How do they give the opportunity for champions to be seen? Because there's nothing better than somebody who's had a problem, solved it, and can now talk, you know, detailed about how they did it, what the solution looks like, what the value is. Um, it's incredibly powerful. So you're right, champions are very, very important. Yeah, and again, it, it feeds into what, what we said earlier about it, it's not just a customer thing, not just a vendor thing, it's working together. So some of the things sort of resonate, again, from a sense of perspective, where we're supporting the customer to provide the business case, or to what if they need to present internally to 
yeah. then the vendors there to to support. Yeah, I mean, we we you know we we go to the extent of building into our platform this portfolio management where you can identify value. You know, we will push on the capabilities there to give to an ideation portal. Um, you know, we'll give the ability for. Um, specific projects to showcase that project. Um, so, mm. part of the platform should be that ability for you to, you know, showcase it without being in front of um, someone, but to at least gather all the metrics and data together. But our role as as the vendor is to make sure that there's an opportunity for those people to really shine and build careers and build, you know, brands off the back of it. Um, you know, it always I always find it quite humbling when you go to an organisation you find people who've never built software before, who now, you know, have taken on that challenge, solved it, and wake up every day and build software, um, you know, an impact business with real value. It's great to see that kind of thing happening. Yeah. More and, more. and getting the rec recognition, and the whether recognition. through, yeah, yeah, through promotion. And Absolute promotions, yeah. visibility, they're seen as a change agent. A leader. A leader, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and I wonder how many, you know, don't disrespect because you know, from a pro developer perspective, there's also I don't what I don't what I'm clear is that there's also a role a role for pro development in there, right? So for people who deeply understand software, deeply understand architecture, I think they have to be part of the process. They need to be part of this sort of melting pot of fusion teams um, because you need their expertise, you know, to help you make the right decisions architecturally. You know, just putting a database together might be too difficult, but having pro developers who can then use technologies to create further capabilities that less experienced developers can use. So w we believe that bringing pro dev and, and, and no developers together, incredibly important. So there's also a, a springboard for professional developers part of that. Because I wonder sometimes, you know, in, in that pro dev world, it's quite hard to shine because you're probably buried deeply in some large software development team somewhere. And whilst the outcome may well be a successful project, um, it, it's probably a big team. Whereas if you look at a, you know, a, a low code team, they're six to eight people, maybe 10, ten's a big team, right? So there's an opportunity to shine in there and to showcase your skills against a specific deliverable and outcome. So, it, you know, let's say champions do emerge very quickly from those environments yeah. um, and to, to use those. Um, so building a career is a great way to um, to approach it with Vendix and Loco. I think you're right. I think it, organic's the right word because if you try to thrust this, you know, yeah. you must do this, then <laughs> yeah. But if it happens organic, they're using the tool and they're seeing success and yep. they're they're peer, you know, they're being praised by their their boss yep. to get promoted. Then it's like a it's like me building the momentum, yeah, isn't it? For the success. You know, it's it's and you know, some people love that, some people don't, right? But there's plenty of people use our technology and they quietly go about their business and mm. they add massive value. There is that, that use it as a springboard, but from an executive perspective in a business, finding those people, because they're the change agents. Mm. They're the people that make, they're probably already making a difference in your business. They're probably using, I don't know, multiple different technologies today to solve problems, but they just don't have the springboard and the visibility to do it. So creating that culture and organization structure around those people, you start to see more and more people pop up with those skills and all of a sudden, you know, it starts to spread like wildfire. And, um, that's a, a, one of the most important parts of getting the transformational or digital transformation right, I think. Okay, and I think that's a fantastic way to end. I think just before um, we finish this session, which again has been really valuable for me, I've learned a lot as well, as hopefully the audience has too. But um, maybe you just could explain a few areas where people could, or a few places sorry, where people could find out more about Mendix, Nick. Um, yeah, well, I mean, come to the website, you know, www.mendix.com, and we've got a whole bunch of information on there. Um, some might say too much, but we've got a lot of information <laughs> on there. So, you know, jump on um, everything from technical evaluation guides. You can sign up for the product. You know, what's interesting about Mendix is Mendix is free, right? So you can download the Mendix development environment to your machine and start building applications today. And that could be a mobile application, it could be a PWA application, it could be a a web or it could be all three, right? Same kind of skill set, sign up, bunch of tutorials online. You could build your first application this afternoon. Um, so I encourage you to do that. Um, for the sort of maybe the C-level execs who are listening to this, there's a lot of information on there, our methodology and our digital execution practice on there as well. But I think that's the best place to go. Or, you know, give, a, give one of our officers a call and engage with one of our, um, our uh, experts there and I'm sure there'll be more than happy to help, but all the information is on the website. 
Fantastic. And a great LinkedIn feed as well, because I follow that. So. LinkedIn, yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can add those at the bottom. Of, of course, yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> add the links. I think there's a few different tools we, we mentioned as well, like digital maturity assessment. Yes. So we can, yeah. we'll add some links in to some yeah. of those key That'd resources as well. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that's all that's left to say is thank you very much, Nick, for a very interesting conversation and for the invite to your lovely yeah. office in London. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for coming and uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, fantastic. You thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So that was today's episode. Um, thank you very much for watching or listening on whatever platform you're on. Um, if you want to listen to the next episode or watch the next episode, please subscribe via the usual channels. See you again on the next episode. Thank you very much. Please like and subscribe on all major podcast channels and find out more about Sensei Predictive Maintenance at Siemens.com.